Been after yeah, yeah. I'll just check in with her next time I go. I mean, it's a great room, that community yeah. room, and it's free to 5013C. Yeah, okay, yeah. no time, folks. Um, as you know, as you can see, for people in the room here, we are tight on chairs. We're looking to get more. Um, otherwise, um, at the table are members of the LRPC only. So that's why uh, we want people to get to the table and then members of the public on the outside. Please be quiet. Okay. Um, we are recording right now. Um, so we are a number of things we have to go over um, <laughs> before we actually get going into the meeting. Um, welcome. This is the joint uh, long range planning meeting hybrid meeting for the Melwood Special Lot General Land Use Plan study. Um, we're holding this hybrid public meeting, which enables remote electronic participation as legally authorized by the Code of Virginia, per the Planning Commission's electronic meeting policy adopted on July 7, 2022. Um, I think all the commissioners here, do we have any commissioners who are online so by phone? So raise your virtual hand so we can tell. I'm not seeing anybody. Um, at this time, I'd like to orient everyone to a hybrid environment and cover a few specifics about how tonight's meeting will run. Uh, members of the public may and do attend this meeting here in person or electronically by using the Microsoft Teams link provided on the LRPC web pages. County's events calendar and the email notification sent to LRPC email subscribers. Additionally, there is a dial in phone option for those who wish to use it. For planning commission commissioners joining virtually, if anyone loses internet connectivity during today's meeting, please reconnect with us by phone. Please keep your phones and devices muted until you're called upon. Turn off the sound to any other devices around you to minimize it. For the virtual attendees using Microsoft Teams, please turn off your video feed. I'll address when it's appropriate to turn it on in a moment. The Microsoft Teams meeting chat is active for two purposes. One is for participants who need technical assistance and for other attendees to pose brief clarifying questions to the larger audience. While these will be monitored, they will not be formally Staff may address these comments as appropriate. Teams chat should not be used for discussion or inappropriate statement. Those who are planning to provide public comment will still need to do so at the end of tonight's meeting, as the chat will not serve that purpose. Um, there will be two periods of public. There will be a period of public comment for this meeting, which will follow the LRPC discussion item. All public comments must be shared verbally for the record during that assigned public testimony period. Um, I'd also like to invite. Remind everybody who's in the room to speak slowly and clearly because the microphones are up ceiling. That way, people who are online or by phone can make sure that you're saying better. Um, in addition, if you'd like to share your screen, please request permission from the LRPC chair prior to doing so. As, and a few reminders members of the LRPC are planning commission members. Um, and unless the matter is being reviewed, March a special RPC subgroup. Subgroup is a distinct public body, including members of the commission um, and representatives of other advisors. Um, we have a roster for this LRPC, which is a subgroup. Um, and that's been based on the needs of this particular project and is adopted by the Planning Commission at their regular monthly public hearing. In addition, the names and email addresses of LRPC. PC subgroups are being published on the county's website um, and a form of three members, including one planning commissioner, must attend in person to allow other subgroup members to participate remotely. We do have a quorum here tonight. Um, more information on LRPC subgroup membership and when LRPC subgroups are established and scheduled is found at the LRPC's webpage. Um, if commissioners participating virtually wish to be recognized to speak on an item during the course of the meeting, please turn your video feed on and raise your virtual hand on Teams. Um, I and the staff will monitor that to let us know that you're when you when it's time to recognize you. Um, now, for members of the public, we have many here tonight and we'll soon more virtually. Um, 
we'd like to provide feedback and comment. Um, unlike the Planning Commission's regular meetings, the LRG, LRPC agenda items are not public hearings. Therefore, the public comment is at the LRPC chair's discretion and meeting discussion is concluded. We will have public comment tonight. Um, you will be called on at the end of the LRPC discussion to speak on tonight's item. Um, the speaking time will depend on how many speakers we have here this evening. Um, the way it'll work is I'll call for each speaker after, after we're done, um, and I'll ask the staff to let me know if we have any virtual attendees in addition to people who are here. Uh, we're sending around a sheet to sign up for public comment. Um, staff will acknowledge speakers on the team's chat. That's why please indicate in the chat that you'd like to provide comment with your name so we can add it to the list of speakers. Um, members of the public attending virtually will speak first, followed by those who are in the room here. Um, when virtual attendees are called upon to speak, you must be the one to unmute yourself by clicking on the microphone icon located on the meeting man bar. The moderator does not have the ability to unmute you. You will be muted when your time is concluded. Um, as an alternative, public comment is available and may be provided on the public comment form listed on the LRPC webpage. And finally, this is a public forum. Student is being recorded and will be posted on the campus website. All information associated with tonight's meeting, whether written or spoken, is subject to the Freedom of Information Act requirements. Now, before we start, let's go around the room so we know who's here and who everybody else is. As I mentioned, I'm Jim Lane Tell me I'm chairing tonight's LRPC meeting. I'm Lee Peters, Planning Commission. Peter Robertson, Planning Commission. Uh, Eric Berkey, Planning Commission. I'm Stacey Meyer, Roar Highlands. Kathy Pascar, Walsh Colucci. I'm Mike Heminger, Housing Commission. Mia Bagley, Planning Commission. Uh, so Hill saying Transportation Commission. Tony Steiner, Planning Commission. Eric Gabata, Planning Commission. John Steele, Arlington Ridge Association. Eric Castle, uh, Crystal City Civic Association. <clears throat> okay. Daniel, yeah, we're Planning Commission. Um, you will be at the, if Doris doesn't show up, you'll see here. Um, you will otherwise be at the table. Yeah. Right, we're looking for more chairs, but it's so much over the table. Um, we'll go around in the room here now, starting back here. Uh, Alyssa Green. And Aurora Island. Andrew Hay. Andy Deborah. Lauren Riley. Others, Pats of Melwood. Rachel. Hey, Jacoby, Aurora Island. Uh, Natasha Atkins, Rock Island Association. Uh, Christine Lee, uh, President of the uh, Aurora Highlands. Jennifer Lucey. Uh, that was the same. My son, Longbaum, a uh, not speaking autistic, is a uh, red Sorry, can you hear? A little bit louder. Yes, you have to be louder. Speak yeah, my son is Juan Vaughn. He's a um, non-speaking autistic who lives independently at Gillian Place. And I, my, uh, I'm Juan, yeah, his mom. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Josue Amai, and I'm with our staff. Our Gillian Place Planning Commission. Hello, I'm Jennifer Lee, Planning Commission. Hi, Selena Benovi from Lion Village. Stephanie uh, Williams, uh, neighbor. Mike Garing, Columbia Heights Dickens. Mac Wallach, uh, Arlington resident. Andy Greenwood, Aurora Highlands. I'm on the phone, but trying to come into the team's meeting. Jackie Winters, I'm on the line. Steve Buffer, Arlington. Uh, we'll now. Judith Cavalli, Mustang. Margo Greenley, our stomping ground. Zuzek, Arlington County Planning Commission. Okay, um, let's go online. Chair Sherpa. With... I said, and Chair Sherpa. <laughs> Chair Sherpa. Um, do we have any commissioners who are online? Margaret McGilvery, Housing Commission. Okay, um, Mike is already here, so we can only have one of the two of you represent Housing Commission. Make your choice. Okay. I'll, I'll step off. Okay. Mike, you're in. Also, Adam Theo, Transportation Commission. Okay. Uh, 
Um, Theo, you are. We already have uh, Adam Theo, Transportation Commission. Okay, um, so he has already represented TC. All right. So he would be a member of the public tonight. Got Sounds it. good. Okay. Um, any other commissioners? Okay, great. Um, working to do that now. Okay. Um, if you, yeah, we have a number of people that have come on who are presumably members of the public. Um, we're not going to go through everybody who's online uh, for that. But remember, as I mentioned on the chat, if you wish to make a public comment at the end, put your name in the chat so we can list you so we can get to that. And as I mentioned, depending on how many people we have for public comment, that will determine how much time you have for your comments. Um, tonight, we'll first off start with staff presentation. We will then move to an applicant presentation, and then we will move to Aurora Highlands presentation. So, um, staff, the table's yours. Um, if you have a camera on and you're um, online, please turn your camera video off. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Margaret Rhodes and I'm with Rose County. And please let me know in the room or if online you could not hear me. Um, this presentation, this presentation will cover, cover a number of things and hopefully we'll move things through things fairly quickly. First, it will provide a brief overview of the special general land use plan study process. Next, it will review the background and then the scope for this tier two review. The presentation will then shift focus to review the existing conditions for the study area, including relevant policy guidance and a site analysis of the study area. Then the applicant will make a short presentation. Next, staff presentation will resume. We will review proposed guiding planning principles and key considerations for the study area. Then we will review preliminary massing study scenarios for the study area. If we could mute other devices. Next, we will look at the results of the community engagement session and the preliminary transportation analysis. Finally, the presentation will walk through the discussion topics for this evening and the next steps for the study process. There are really three areas that we're looking for your feedback on tonight. One, the proposed refinements to the guiding principles. Two, any proposed refinements to the massing standards. And three, Input on building setbacks on 23rd Street South. To start off this presentation, we will quickly cover the background for the special GLUB study process, special general land use plan or GLUB. <clears throat> the special GLUB study process consists of two tiers of review. The tier one initial review first determines whether a full special GLUB study or some other review process is appropriate. If the initial review finds that a special club study is appropriate, staff then conducts a tier two review, a full study. At the tier one review meeting for this study, it was determined that a full review was warranted for the site. The full study results in a study document and a recommendation to advertise or not to advertise a GLOB amendment. These staff recommendations are then reviewed and considered by the planning commission and the county board at public hearings. If a new GLUB designation is deemed within the realm of consideration by the county board, then a future site plan application could eventually be submitted. The site plan would be reviewed by the site plan review committee based on the recommendation in the study document. And it's important to remember that the county board is the body that makes the decisions on the land use. It is advised by the planning commission, which is in turn advised by the long range planning committee. The group that we are here tonight. Here's a visual graphic of the study process. 
So we've completed the tier one review. We're currently conducting the tier two review. And then should there be a recommendation to advertise or not to advertise? And should there be a site plan application? Then there's a whole other review process that would follow the site plan review process, which allows for more opportunities for public engagement. Applicant has submitted an application uh, with an interest in building a primarily residential building of approximately five stories with Melwood operations in the first one to ten floors, providing affordable housing on the upper floors with some unit members for residents. Approximately 22,200 gross square feet is being proposed for the Melwood program for the proposed total of 104 multifamily units. The applicant's request is for an amendment to the general land use plan or bluff to change the designation from public to the low medium level, 16 to 36 units per acre for parcel A, with no proposed change to the public designation for parcel B. Well, actually, the applicant would like to change that, but we are not uh, uh, contemplating a change to the public designation for parcel B, which will remain a public park. Nelly Custis Park. The applicant also anticipates an associated rezoning from the C1 local commercial district, parcel A, the RA818 multiple family district, a mixed use district, and rezoning for parcel B, from also to the RA818 multiple family dwelling district. This rezoning would be examined at a future point concurrent with a potential site plan application. Next, we will review the background for the special glove study. Here you can see an aerial of the subject site. Subject site is located at 750 23rd Street South between South Hayes Street, South Grant Street, and Aurora Highlands neighborhood. Site is situated on the south side of 23rd Street South, approximately two blocks west of Restaurant Row. Comprised of two parcels, site is currently occupied by the Melwood Horticultural Training Center, and a portion of the site is a part of Nellie Custis Park for a previously recorded public access easement. The block also includes the BHC Immediate Care Center, other business, and two single detached homes. The general land use plan establishes the county's land use vision. This slide identifies the existing block designations for the subject site and the surrounding area. Subject site is currently designated public, and the adjacent properties are designated public and low residential, which is one to 10 units per acre, as shown here. Subject block consists of a one square building designated low residential and two single dwelling homes, also designated low residential. Across 23rd Street South, church, and one or two story commercial buildings, designated low residential. To the east and across South Grant Street is another church designated low residential. And finally to the west and across South Hay Street is another church designated semi-public. This slide identifies the current zoning district near the subject site. The subject site you can see here is C1 near 23rd Street and R6 near Nellie Custis Park. If we go to the next slide, you can see that the site is again the C1, which is a local commercial district, parcel A, and R6, a one family dwelling district, parcel B. And here we can see the zoning categories that are typically associated with a requested low medium residential designation R1530, RA1426, and RA18 are the feed three districts that we typically associate with low medium residential. By site plan, R818 allows for multifamily development up to 60 feet in height and up to 1.5 floor area ratio or FAR density. In developing this study, staff reviewed various comprehensive plan documents, which included the general land use plan, the affordable housing master plan, <laughs> Master Transportation Plan and the Historic and Cultural Resources Plan, which was formerly known as the Historic Conservation Plan. 
next part of the presentation reviews the scope for this study. At the tier one LRPC meeting, feedback included a recommendation to study the requested low medium residential lot designation for a full tier two review. There's a lack of adopted planning guidance for this site. Additionally, there is an inconsistency between the private use and ownership of parcel A and the public lot designation C1 and R6 zoning for the public designation. The LRPC identified concerns regarding building height, density, form and scale, transitions, the use mix, and impacts on Nelly Custis Park. Staff utilized this initial feedback as an input in the development of the scope for this tier two review. As a part of this study, we are evaluating the appropriateness of amending the glove designation for parcel A to low medium residential. This block designation and the associated RAH category could potentially provide for a form of development compatible with the surrounding context. Analyzing the setbacks, building placement, tapering, and screening, however, is an important part of the analysis. We'll be looking at this site through this vector book study as opposed to through a broader small area plan. This site is uniquely situated. Staff has developed a special book study with a mind towards equity. We'll continue to keep equity at the forefront throughout the study process and the multiple community engagement opportunities that are a part of this process. The composition of the LRPC is purposefully broad and inclusive. The entire process has been crafted to consider who benefits, who is burdened, who is missing, and how the recommendation should address the answers to these questions. In addition to the existing adopted policy, guidance for the study area is also informed by an analysis of the existing site. This map provides an overview of the observed land uses, public spaces, transit and bicycle infrastructure, tree canopy, and loading and parking access in the vicinity of the study area. This site is centrally located within a cluster of institutional uses which serve as a transition and buffer to the lower density residential. In terms of transportation services, the site is located seven miles from the Crystal City Metro Station and is serviced by two Metro bus lines. Nearby are a bike share station. This site has a higher level of transportation services than any other places in the county, given its location both near the Crystal City Metro and on an artery. Here we can see the surrounding building heights. Heights on the block frontages adjacent to the site range from 15 to 40 feet height. And now we will turn it over to the applicant for a very brief presentation. Oh, no fair. <laughs> uh, good evening, Kathy Puskar with Walsh Kaluji. I'm here on behalf of Melwood and Wesley Housing. I'd like to turn for a second to let Larissa Couts, President and CEO of Melwood, introduce Melwood. Next. I'm the President and CEO of Melwood. Melwood is been a leader in the employer and advocate and a service provider for people with disabilities through this region for over 60 years. Um, last year, we served over 3,000 individuals with disabilities in, in the DV, DMV area. Our mission is to advocate for and empower people with disabilities by expanding opportunities to live, work, and thrive in our community. We do this through employment and life skills training, community engagement, and meeting other critical needs of our community members with disabilities. Only a few decades ago, most people with intellectual or developmental disabilities lived in institutions. Thankfully, we are beyond that point as a society but the current reality is that people with disabilities face continued constraints on achieving housing independence, with most living with aging caregivers or in-group homes segregated from the rest of the community. The barriers for finding affordable, inclusive, accessible, walkable places to live independently in Arlington for people with disabilities are virtually impossible to overcome. We are fortunate to own this property on 23rd Street in a beautiful neighborhood with bus lines, a metro, restaurants, parks, and a wonderful community of neighbors. Community that we have embraced through public events, allowing the site to be used as a home place, 
and providing space to smaller local nonprofit partners. It's the ideal location for someone with a disability to thrive in a welcome, inclusive setting. We urge the LRPC to approve. Thank you. And quickly, Judith Cabelli, Vice President of Real Estate Development for our partner, Wesley Housing. Hi, good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here as well as to serve as Melwood's development partner. Uh, Wesley Housing is an affordable housing developer, um, owner, operator, and resident services provider that's been around since 1974. So we're nearing our 50th anniversary. We um, see a lot of synergy between our mission and what we do and that of Melwood, and we are really excited to have an honor to have the opportunity to partner in developing a really truly inclusive community. We are excited for that to continue moving forward. Um, when we develop our communities, we are long term owners and operators. So, as you can see on this slide, it's a little bit of information about um, our experience and development um, across the region. We own and operate 30 communities across Virginia and the DC region six different Virginia jurisdictions, um, as well as in the district, but seven of our specific communities are in Arlington County. Over time, in the 50 years, we've developed a total of 35 communities, and we are very much looking forward to continuing this process in our partnership. And if you looked at this presentation online, we realized we had a typo. The waypoint at Fairlington is in the city of Alexandria, and the Arden is in County. Fairfax. And the, in Fairfax County. the Arden is in. I'm so, oh, sorry, you just said waypoint. And the Arden is in Fairfax County. So we mislabeled those on the presentation. So very quickly, I will thank you for those introductions. Um, we did request a GLUP amendment from public to low medium residential for both parcel A and B. The reason we requested it on B is because we were intending. Uh, to consolidate those properties and use the density from parcel B on our development. However, um, that is something that is permitted through the swap agreement with the county back in 1981. We do not plan to build on it because that swap agreement also requires us to keep that land as public land and park land. And so um, we are okay with removing or not having that GLUP amendment uh, so long as we are allowed to rezone the property uh, to allow us to put that uh, density into the building consistent with that swap agreement. So we are fine with that. Um, just a little bit about this. The first time uh, when we were at the tier one, we did have a proposal uh, that everyone looked at. And that proposal you can see here. Um, I think that proposal uh, at the time may have contemplated the potential uh, preservation of the historic facade of the school. The more research we have done on the school and the more research we have done on the building, um, we no longer think it is advisable um, to preserve that facade. Um, that building has changed over time. And while it is located within the overall Aurora Heights uh, Highlands Historic District, it's not listed on the historic resource inventory and it's not listed in uh, preservation overlay district. So we have uh, come up with a uh, two alternative proposals and let me make it clear that these are just massing studies. There's uh, if we get the GLUP amendment, there is a whole nother process, which is a 4.1 site plan process in which we get into the specifics of the design and the building. But here what you see are two different alternatives. Concept A has five stories and is set back with some open space and concept B is four stories pushed closer to the street with a more urban frontage. Next. And this is just another uh, Time is up. image of that. And we um, think we could work within the constructs of either of those alternatives. Um, they have different advantages and disadvantages. You're up. Oh, great. Uh, okay, um, I'm Stacy Meyer. I'm with Aurora Highlands. Uh, we have a very quick presentation. Thank you, Jim, and the LRPC for allowing us to present. Uh, happy to be here. Um, so, next slide. Um, yeah. One of us is backwards. Okay. The sorry about that. The association um, does not support this application because it's out of scale with the neighborhood. The association's overwhelming objection should have been more enough to stop this application at tier one over a year ago. And yet here we are on the slide are our uh, statistics from our um, uh, organization's uh, online survey. Next slide. Uh, 
Uh, Clarendon Presbyterian Church has applied for similar upzoning as Melwood. And the civic associations in Clarendon, of which there are several, are in the same situation as in our highlands. People all over Arlington are up in arms about the special GLUP study process once they learn about it and the precedent approval these proposals will set. There's a change.org petition that's been recently started and has over 900 signatures opposing this process and legal counsel has been retained. Next slide, please. Uh, the GLUP amendment process was taken up by the Arlington County Civic Federation, um, an umbrella organization of over 80 civic groups last year. And uh, this resolution asks for the county to seek agreement from adjacent neighbors and the applicable civic association upzoning proposals. That resolution was approved to seek agreement. Next slide, please. Uh, we've learned a lot about zoning in the last two years. Um, we've learned that in Virginia, the intent of zoning is to further the public, not the private interest. And nothing about increasing density in a historic single family neighborhood that's already subject to several sector plans to maintain its character serves the public interest. Claims of needing affordable housing in this location are not correct, even if they were relevant to this application, which they are not. There's a significant amount of affordable housing in Aurora Highlands since Amazon's investment in Crystal House. Livability 22202 in its recent update acknowledges the significant investments that have been made in affordable housing in our neighborhood, and it's not advocating for more, rather focusing on helping residents maintain their existing housing. Next slide, please. Uh, the 2019 GLUP Amendment online brochure invites and accepts fees for private landowners to request zoning changes to serve their private interests. Given a glossy brochure, but amending the GLUP solely to serve the private interests of the landowner is not in keeping with the intent of Virginia law, which requires zoning to serve the public interest and not the individual property owner, no matter how good their work is, or in the case of the church, how righteous they may be. We have asked the county to provide its legal opinion as to how this process is in keeping with Virginia law, but we have not gotten a response to date. Next slide, please. The stated intent of the GLUP amendment process in 2008 was to account for what was termed unanticipated planning issues, but nothing about this site is unanticipated. Next slide. The site is planned to remain as is in the middle of the existing historic single family neighborhood for the GLUP, surrounded by historic single family houses. Next slide, please. The site is planned to be zoned as it is. It's a low density historic single family neighborhood for the Crystal City Sector Plan. And there's some highlighted text, the Pentagon City Sector Plan, the Pentagon City Master Development Plan, and the Neighborhood Conservation Plan. Next slide. Melwood provided this massing diagram and states they cannot proceed with any smaller development. This is the only size they can have. We oppose this proposal because it's way out of scale with the neighborhood and it will be a nuisance. It's too dense, too tall, too big. It'll have too much traffic imposed on current parking arrangements with adjacent churches, including the Latter-day Saints and the uh, 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 Calvary, eliminate mature landscaping, and it looms over and negatively impacts the park. Nellie Custa Park is at Nellie Custis Park is a small, heavily used park which provides much needed natural space and playground space for the surrounding urban neighborhood and its daycare centers. Uh, finally, there's no provisions to maintain the existing polling place. Um, that's public. Uh, the project, oh, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, the GLUP amendment approval criteria. None of this, the project meets none of the criteria listed for approval of a special GLUP amendment application for this er excerpt from a letter from Royal Highland Civics Association that was sent November 21st. Nothing has changed. We again ask that this application be rejected and the process be stopped now. Our civic associate, next slide, please. Our civic association has spent thousands of volunteer hours reviewing the Melwood proposal and disseminating it to our neighbors. There's a heavy, unnecessary burden that this process places on the neighborhood and its unpaid volunteers. We've had to pack a lot into five minutes this evening, and I would encourage you to take the time to read the material. If there's questions, contact us afterwards. The Civic Association's overwhelming objection should have been more than enough to stop the application process at tier one last year. The process continues to be extremely divisive and is a departure from Arlington's tradition of ground up grassroots planning. Worst of all, and sadly, the lack of agency afforded us and the lack of communication from the county has negatively impacted our trust in the planning process and our county government.
Thank you. Um, we've done the presentations and now we're open to the table. Uh -uh. Yep. I still have a little bit more to say. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we would like to review the proposed guiding plant planning principles, and there are four guiding planning principles that we share with you for the engagement session. Um, we will draft to provide guidance for the study area. And it's important to note that these are intended to be high level. This is a high level land use analysis. We're not looking at a specific project here. They were derived from adopted plan guidance, good planning principles, and an analysis of the site. And this was one of the main topics that we included uh, in that community engagement on which your input was sought. Next, we'll look briefly at the preliminary massing scenarios. And again, these were another major topic of the recent community engagement session. The preliminary massing scenarios illustrate a range of height and massing options under RA 818. It is important to note that these scenarios are not intended to convey staff's preferred scenarios, but rather to spark discussion about building height and density, site coverage and placement. Based on the input we received from the LRPC and the community, these scenarios may be further refined. In terms of modeling assumptions, we're assuming that the parking will be located primarily underground, that access will be from South Grant Street as opposed to the arterial, and that the floor heights for the ground level would be approximately 15 feet, and the floor heights for the upper stories to be approximately 10 feet. Staff has prepared 45 foot and 60 foot scenarios. 45 foot scenario is generally consistent with ground in contact and is only modestly taller than the building height permitted by right, 35 feet, in adjacent low density commercial residential areas. The 60 foot scenario provides additional potential usable area and potentially allows for some of the building height to be shifted on the site. Density would be determined by the building form and pertinent zoning regulations. Here we can see the existing condition under 35 feet. This scenario illustrates how the site might look with a 45 foot building in relation to the ground in context. This scenario depicts a 60 foot building. The building is set back from 23rd Street on the eastern side and steps down towards Nellie Custis Park. This slide and the next two analyze how well the two scenarios relate to the guiding planning principles. Scenario two is modestly taller than the surrounding commercial and residential. In this scenario, the building will likely cover more of the site than in the 60 foot scenario, which potentially allows for the shift of some density, some building height to the front of the site, creating more opportunities for tapering and transition. Redevelopment of the site by a site plan would also result in improved ground level conditions under either scenario. 60 foot scenario may also allow for maintaining or interpreting the historic facade of what was the Nellie Custis School. For both scenarios, there's a preference for access off South Grand Street, uh, as I mentioned, as opposed to the artillery. Mm -hmm. Redevelopment by site plan would, necess would necessitate connectivity and safety improvements under either scenario. The lower building height, scenario two, increases the likelihood of a larger building footprint to support the potential development program, while the greater building height of scenario three increases the potential for a smaller building footprint, which could allow potentially for greater tree conservation and open space on site. And now we'll look at the community engagement session. So this was a three week community engagement session. We had 240 respondents. And if you'd like to look through all of the raw data, it is posted on the project web page. In terms of who responded, 61% of respondents are nearby homeowners. 40% visit this area for one or more reasons. And 19% are nearby renters. With regards to the guiding planning principles that we just discussed, 50% strongly agree with uh, principle one, 64% with number two, 44% with number three, and 63% to number four. There is a lot of support for the proposed planning principles. And again, these are high level and intentionally high level. 
this is the high level land use analysis. Uh, again, the full responses are available on the web page if you wish to see them. This was an open ended response. Uh, please share any additional topic areas that you believe should be covered in the proposed principle. We didn't get a lot of responses that directly said, I think you're missing this principle or we can modify this principle. But I would say that the areas of priority based on um, the number of times they were mentioned uh, really are around affordable housing and equitable housing. And then on the areas of concern, it was context and density. So potentially we could discuss if there needs to be an addition or modification of the planning principles surrounding either the housing uh, piece of this or maybe um, uh, elaborating on the Which of the preliminary massing scenarios do, be, do you believe best responds to the proposed guiding planning principles? So this was very interesting. We had about 42% of respondents said the 35 foot building best responded to the guiding principles. Well, 38% said it was the 60 foot scenario. And then just 11% said any of the above and 9% said the 40 foot. Of course, this is not a popularity contest. We are just gathering input and we're looking to hear from all the stakeholders here today. Um, associated with that question, we had another open ended response. Um, please share your reasoning for your response to the previous question about the preliminary massing scenarios. So unsurprisingly, the areas of priority and areas of concern are very similar to those that we saw for the previous open ended response. So the areas of priority were a support for density, support for affordable housing, support for open space and trees. The areas of concern were compatibility and context, concerns about density, and sensitivity to any change. So I'd say some of the important takeaways here, there really was a very close level of support for the 35 and the 60 foot scenarios, and there really wasn't a lot of specific guidance on site design, i.e. setbacks from 23rd Street or some of those other things that I think we should discuss here uh, following the presentation. Next, we'll very quickly look at the preliminary transportation analysis. This was done by um, our Department of Environmental Services staff using the latest edition of the Institute of Transportation Engineers Generation Manual. Here we can see that based on both the 2019 pre pandemic and the 2023 post pandemic traffic volumes in 23rd Street South, um, the scenarios modeled by staff would potentially generate the following peak hour trips made in the AM and the PM. The blue represents transit and active trips, and the yellow represents vehicular trips. And again, this is based on these scenarios that staff have prepared. And so based on this data, preliminary review appears to show that the number of proposed trips um, could be supported by the existing transportation system. It's important to note, however, that if the site plan application was filed, more in-depth analysis would be needed to determine if there are transportation constraints or challenges that might need to be mitigated. And to reiterate, these are the topics that I think we would like to have input on tonight. So you know, if there are any clarifying questions, first of all, but we'd really like to hear from you on potential refinements to the guiding principles, if there are potential refinements needed to the massing scenarios, specifically building height and transitions are important areas. That are and then what sort of building setbacks might be most appropriate on 23rd Street stuff? We should be taking into consideration green space, trees, historic preservation, lot coverage, trade offs, building and massing, uh, potential number of units, etc. So, those are some of the things that we would like your input on tonight. And then, lastly, in terms of next steps, food, um, we would go back and emphasize the input from this meeting and that we've received from the comments that people have submitted. 
um, from the online engagement session. We develop a brief study document. We would then post that online and have um, a period. And then uh, there would be public hearings where you all are again invited to participate at the Planning Commission and County Board on either a request to advertise or a request not to advertise and acceptance of the study document which summarizes the findings of this study. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you. Okay, great. So we are now um, at ready for discussion here. So the first thing we'll do is clarifying questions. Um, if you have questions for any of the about any of the presentations, um, now we'll time to do those. Uh, Commissioner Bagley, yeah, um, speak up because yes, um, our, staff sure. just clarified for the audience that the study this moves forward from a study to a study document that does not necessarily mean this is an SPRC. We've done all. Could you just clarify for them so that they? Better understand what that process is. Sure. So, this is really just a study process. And so, at the conclusion of this study, we will prepare a study document that memorializes the discussions and our analysis. Um, and that's a policy document that we would take to the Planning Commission and the County Board. Um, it would be something that would be accepted by the County Board. It, it's not a legally binding document. And no change to the general land use plan or the zoning orders is part of this process. We would merely be recommending that uh, club fees would be in the realm of consideration, or maybe not in the realm of consideration. So that would be interesting. Yes. We would take that to the county board, planning commission, the county board. So they're the deciders. We're informing the planning commission, who's in turn informing the county board. And then at the conclusion of the study, the county board would take action and say, we would like to say this is in the realm of consideration and, and we could advertise this or not. And then no changes are actually made to either the block or the zoning until and unless there is at some future date a potentially appropriate site plan application. And so the site plan, if there was a site plan application ultimately submitted here, it would be reviewed against the, the recommendations in our study document. And there's a whole process that I'm sure some of you are familiar with, with more meetings like this, um, online engagement, um, and then ultimately, again, public hearings at the planning commission. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. Richard Berkey was next. Well, then. Very, very brief follow-up. So, so just so we're at the same page, because I know a lot of folks in the community have expressed concerns about this, like, you know, we'll make a change to the club, but then we'll rug will get pulled out from underneath us, right? And so what you're explaining basically is that the glove change, potential glove change, and then the site plan would would basically come maybe be sequenced together if we ultimately get to that place. So that it is it is really going to be specific to a potential site plan out. Absolutely, and that's an important nuance. So, no changes to the glove are being made as part of this or this zoning. So, only unless there was an appropriate site plan application that the county board supported, would they adopt that as a package with a glove and a rezoning potentially? It would all come as a package. And you're correct that there are no changes are being made proactively. And there's a whole nice worry well, what if they sold the property? What would happen? No changes are being made at this time. It would be only if there was this future package for a site plan that the county board wanted to support. Great. I, I just want to make sure we're clear on that, and hopefully that gives some folks a little bit of chance. Thanks. I have a question, not about the presentation, but about the uh, LRPC. I remember at the tier one there was a Parks and Rec commissioner, and I don't know if there was a county uh, historic preservation commissioner. <laughs> Uh, are they still on the LRPC? Are they here? I didn't see. I I, I didn't hear from them. Uh, yeah, historic landmark is on. I don't believe it. Parks and Rec is on it, but um, PD is not here. Yeah. Unless she's unless they're online. Um, but they do not. Would it be Okay. Uh, because I, I remember the Parks and Rec uh, members of this committee commissioner uh, had issues or uh, concerns about Nellie Custis Park, and. Um, I would like to make a clarification. Is that okay? 
um, the um, there was a statement by somebody in the presentations about uh, talking about the Nelly Custis School. It is a contributing building to the historic designation of the neighborhood. Absolutely is. It's a, going to be 100 years old this year. It's celebrating its 100 year old birthday, and it's one of the few schools that are historic that are remaining in Arlington. So while it's not a landmark building, um, and it's it has historical significance. Wait, Commissioner Tavera, Steiner, and then. Actually, could, could you go to them and then come back to me? Mm -hmm. Could you come back to me if that's sure. okay? Okay, Commissioner Steiner. Strider, by the way. Strider, sorry, Strider. Oh, we've been we've been working together six months, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my question for the developer, I have two quick ones. So first of all, yeah, uh, what percentage of the units will be for will be accessible for individuals with disabilities? Would be one hundred percent. That's the break. Larissa, can you answer that? Some more SBRC type questions. Oh. Those are more details. Okay. Yeah. I'm really feeling that tonight is more sure massing and that sort of thing. Okay. And then with the existing Melwood structure, would that fit into this, or would that be for a later time? The like, existing structure, like the existing building, was there? Why would that not be uh, preserved in this uh, redevelopment? Well, as I mentioned before, despite the fact that yeah. it is. Um, part of the Aurora Highlands Historic District. It's not listed mm -hmm. on the Historic Resources Inventory List, and it's not within a Historic Preservation Overlay right. District. And the building has been changed over time, many, many times, sure. including uh, the loss of the Grand Central Entrance has been bricked in. There have mm -hmm. been multiple additions. Um, so it does have a history as being a school, but there are other ways to document that than to retain a building that is not on the HRI list. Gotcha. I'd just like to say that that preservation of the potential facade is is a potential topic for tonight. Mm -hmm. I think we need to talk about what 23rd Street should like like. Should there be support for redevelopment? Can we see this slide that you had that shows the facade so everybody can see it? Uh, meanwhile, um, Mr. Peterson. Yes. Um, so I was looking at the plant, the guiding planning principles. And I noticed there isn't anything here that specifically mentions the uh, beneficial nature of the project from you know, helping people with disabilities, helping people with affordable housing. And I wasn't sure if we should add a fifth guiding principle that if we're going to approve this project, it should serve one of the county's um, established priorities of equity. Because if the you know if the applicant was to sell the property, we wouldn't want to see luxury condos um, at this location possibly, but there may be some of us who would be willing to support a project like this um, if it was serving a county established priority of equity. And that's a good question because I'm not sure to what degree an LPC process can put constraints of that nature since this is a high level and what could go here is more like physically what could go here rather than uses beyond what the club would otherwise allow. I'm not sure to what degree we can restrict that, uh, that type of thing. I know in previous, and the staff can correct me if I'm wrong, when we've done previous special club studies, we were able to constrain height, density, that sort of thing, even beyond what the zoning would otherwise allow. Uh, we had that happen. I don't know whether we're able to do any sort of constraints on actual uses. This special bluff study was approved and then the applicant sold to the developer who then proposed a project of luxury apartments that met all four of these planning principles. Then if you go to SPRC and theoretically planning commission would feel like we should approve this and pass it, the special bluff study. Well, I think um, you know, I think we'll have a lot more recommendations than just these four, and so one of them will be height. So, um, obviously, a 120 foot building, which potentially be achieved, should um, it be you know, there be support for rezoning for an 18, be a hundred project. That's not going to be appropriate here. So, we, I, I think, staff would like to see some recommendations related to height. Um, and compatibility in that study document. So what Jim was talking about. Now remembering that with the Sunrise Special Club study did have we added a principle planning principle. And I think it was something like um 
a preference for senior living on that site. And so potentially something like that, not necessarily restricting use, but maybe indicating a preference could be something we indicate in some way in the study document if it doesn't necessarily rise to the level. Okay. okay. Well, thank you. Um, back to yes. you delayed you, so that's fine. Sorry, no, um, I actually, I, I, I'm really interested in what Commissioner Peterson said, because that's one of the things that I, I've been sort of thinking about that um, I would be more open to adding density if we did have something more concrete, because I, I'm not for adding density just for density's sake. I think that becomes a little more problematic, um, but if we could have something that perhaps uh, speaks to that um, because I'm thinking, you know, this is sort of in terms of building height, it's sort of reminiscent to me of area two and playing Langston Boulevard, which goes up from five to seven stories. Right? So why are we limiting it to five stories? We could potentially go to seven, but if it's going to be just another luxury high rise, then sort of what what's the point um, to, to a certain degree? Um, if there's if, you know, the applicant is just going to sell it later. But sort of just throwing it out there. Just had a question about the height density and massing. Um, would it be true that if it's a lower height, the density might be restrained by the by the height, by you know sidewalks and by the general site command have a lower density than if you allowed a higher density and you know they could um yeah obviously build higher as it were. Yeah, how does that is that is that can, is that true that it the 45 foot might actually limit their density possibilities because of other site constraints? Yeah, so I think that was one of the things we looked at in the presentation. And so um, you know, some of the things we want to talk about tonight are, you know, what kind of setback should we have on what side of tra height transition should we be exploring? And you can see here. This is one of the two scenarios that we put together. Um, and it's showing some tapers, um, some setbacks, uh, that green space that you see today on 23rd Street with the large pine trees, et cetera, right there. Yeah. Um, you could potentially, that could be something that we think is important that we want to put in the study document. Should this redevelop, that area is important to conserve. Maybe the facade is important to conserve. Maybe it's not. Maybe we're maybe the community is more in, you know, if people are supportive of redevelopment, maybe there's more of an interest in more of an urban frontage as opposed to right now. There are a lot of surface parking lots in that area, you know, maybe um, bringing the building edge up closer to 23rd Street to create more of a pedestrian experience there is something that people are more interested in. So those are things to talk about. Um, so my initial question with regards to the historic register of properties was addressed. I align myself with Commissioner Peterson's comments. I think that if we've done it successfully with regards to the sunrise redevelopment, the special block for that, there's no reason we wouldn't be able to put sort of a messaging element to how we want to approach a special block condition here. Um, um, as far as preservation of the facade, can we get that image? Was there an image to show that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. If it's caused, it's okay. I understand we'll technology. It. That's fine. Um, Google Maps. I will. Oh, we can come back. To well, just with regards to the facade, I think that the county staff raised an interesting point as to what we will, the yeah, potential cool. feel for the neighborhood could be. And I think it is worth exploring both avenues in terms of whether or not the property meets the, you know, all the check boxes, you know, for, you know, protections, historic resource, you know, for county standards. I, fine, we can have that conversation or not have that conversation. I think there's perspectives okay. on both sides, but maybe there's merit to preserving that facade for reasons of sort of how it fits in with the community and but 
maybe there's the other side of that is we want a more urban element to this to kind of pull it out more towards the street. I think both of those are conversation points that should be developed further and should be considered if this gets to the point of an SPRC. So I wouldn't want a decision in this body to eliminate either of those options at this point. Thank you, Weir. Uh, a question for Stacey. Um, thanks for your presentation. The, some of the, the polling data and meeting voting data that you've got on your second slide, is there any chance that you have that broken down by geography, like east to west of Pern or north or south of 18th or anything like that? I don't know. Thanks. Sorry. Right. Um, Stacey, I know the applicant. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, to your point about the vertical versus the horizontal, that's where the historic preservation comes in, because in order to get the same density, if to squish the building, it has to get bigger this way, right? It, it's like right. getting the clothes on, you know. And when it gets bigger this way horizontally, it has to go in. It has to get bigger in the front of the building, which is in front of these historic facades. So in order to keep the historic facade, it has to be tall. Disagree with me or if, if I'm not saying this right. And in order for it to keep the same density, the historic facade needs to go. So that is kind of like a math geometry problem. And so the, and the applicant won't or can't accept a lower density. They have to have this, this size, whether it's this tall, and this wide or this tall and this wide? So just to clarify. Okay, thank you. Um, you're correct that there's that push and pull between um, footprint, size, et cetera. Um, I think that because this is a high level land use discussion, that we wanna be talking about the what's the right land use vision here. So it might be something other than what um, is currently being proposed. Um, so I think, we need to be thinking about well, what height in terms of this context um, is most appropriate. And for instance, on this site, is the greater height be more appropriate in the center of the site with some papers down on all sides? So really, as a pedestrian, you're not seeing a lot of height, you know, um, or would it be better to have it lower and occupying a little bit more of the site? I don't know that, um, you know, inclusion of certain elements necessarily is concluded one way or the other. In the in the in the slides in the models you've made, that's sort of what happens. That's sort of what happens. But again, these are just two ways yeah. that we could um, represent it. So if there are important markers that we want to document about that, you know, Sarah was had a good point about setbacks, et cetera, that we might not necessarily want to preclude different options at this juncture but that these are important topics. Yeah, I just wanted to provide a clarification and I think Stacy and sorry, um, you had um, mentioned that the applicant had this proposal and it was a 60 foot proposal and that's all the applicant wants. I know we ran out of time. I just wanted to clarify the reason we have kind of these two new alternatives that show kind of a different massing than what staff's massing is. Basically, the point of that is exactly what you're describing, which is um, we have a certain amount of square footage we want for Melwood to be able to continue to run their operations on site the way they do, and a certain amount of affordable housing uh, to serve our most vulnerable residents as well as uh, Melwood uh, people who are at Melwood uh, on the daily basis. So we, that's why we did go back because we heard from the neighborhood. I mean, we've have heard a lot, but we heard height was an issue. And so we thought, OK, there are trade offs, right? If you didn't save the historic facade and if you didn't save the tree, you could make a building that's more urban frontage that kind of lines up more with the other buildings along 23rd and you could reduce that to four stories. Right. Or if it's important to, you know, keep the tree and keep a setback, um, then the taller height in the middle might make sense. So I wanted to clarify that. Um, we agree that there are trade-offs to be made and, and we're open to those trade-offs, but you are correct that we are trying to make a certain program so that we can qualify for tax credits and kind of get the project done. Um, you know, we probably have a difference of opinion on this historic facade because it does create a lot of constraints, not only with the design of the building, because the way the building sits right now on the site, there's topography on the site, so it sits down low, it creates kind of height issues just 
preserving that facade and getting floor to ceiling heights. And I understand that may be a topic for another day, but I just wanted to clarify that. Yes, we are trying to rezone to the RA 818 and get the GLUP amendment, but whether it's four stories or five stories or some other combination, um, we're open to that. I'm going to make a point that the historic affairs folks may get mad at me, but they're not apparently. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I served on that commission, so I'm going to make that okay. statement anyway. I think we shouldn't narrow ourselves even to the perspective of the facade need to stay where the facade is. Maybe there's a way to have think creatively, and I don't want to put ourselves in a box. I think we're keeping this high level. We're not at an SPRC. Let's take advantage of the fact we're not an SPRC. See creative things where you have an entrance and then an entrance. I've seen creative things where I don't know, walls get. So I'm putting out there that the answer doesn't have to be one thing or the other thing. And I'm challenging this group to not pigeonhole us so that we eliminate creative thinking if we get to an SPRC down the line. And HLRB can get mad at me later. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was just uh, not only to agree with, with you, Commissioner Sandberger, uh, the chair will disagree with me, but another example that I think is very well done um, was the Arlington Presbyterian site uh, and its incorporation of the field stone uh, that the church was built out of into the uh, ground floor of the I know that I know the chair has a differing opinion. <laughs> True. That's where I stand. <laughs> I, I was going to say I associate myself with Commissioner Steinberger. Uh, the first remark is definitely the second remark. <laughs> Pro probably. Um, but um, I do have a, a clarifying question. Actually, we're, we're thinking about step backs because that's one of the things we want to talk about. There's not um, we don't have any rules about uh, uh, setbacks or step backs when they're adjacent to a park like we do here. Do we? Is there anything different about the adjacency to not justice? No, but I think we would want to work with our Department of Parks and Recreation staff to make sure that there were appropriate setbacks transiting neighbors to the park. Um, we certainly don't want to have any negative impacts on that park, and it was done in 2019. Um, so that how any potential future building release to that park is very important. Right. I, so I, think I have a comment. So I think because you're, you're looking for feedback here, how to shape that. I think we should, yeah, keep those options open, but think about those transitions. Um, I I do think that um, while maybe we decide that having lower heights is better for for this, maybe 45 versus a 60. I think 60 is sort of the max. Uh, at this point, I, I think that we should keep our options open. Uh, because we've seen that having that flexibility, the, the applicant may be having that flexibility with the additional open space they may have on the property for other programming or other community benefits or whatever. That might be something that we don't want to take off the table here, um, even though we may ultimately decide or the county board may ultimately decide that they're going to want with some lower heights and sacrifice you know, lot coverage. So that's sort of where I'm leaning. Peterson. Um, so for the purpose of getting more of these uh, um, uh, open space, green space, getting extra plantings. I think the 60 foot building height may be beneficial to the project, but I think I would like to see a um, step back um, to match the uh, adjacent um, building heights, which I think are 35 feet. Um, so on, on along 23rd Street. So I think that's the only one where we're seeing um, the, the higher height, but then there don't appear to be the step backs. Um, and so I think that might. Get a better pedestrian feel if there was at least a step back at, at 30. But I think, like Sarah, uh, Commissioner Steinberger said, I don't think we need to necessarily limit that, but um, I think that would be. Um, I, I think we also saw in the presentation that some of the nearest houses were 35 feet too, and so that would be consistent there. Uh, can I add to Commissioner Berkey's point, um, Ms. Rhodes? Mr. Matuzic, that it would, at the risk of getting a little bit into the SPRC territory, uh, in addition to just blocking and stacking and sculpting for the transition to the park discussion, um, perhaps we could also consider, like the how the how the walls are treated, how the roof is treated, uh, because there's more that we can do to say to to segue into a park than just you know one story here two stories here three stories here if, if the 
if the roof were to be green. Now, how we would in, how we would ensure that that happens over time, that is clearly an SPRC discussion, uh, but I, I'll leave it at that. Thank hey, you. Um, Chair's privilege. Following up on your comment, maybe what we could do is give some sort of preference for specific biophilic elements along the park side of, the, of any building you have to go here, that it isn't simply setbacks, but it has to also have biophilic elements that would be compatible with, with, with a park usage, something like that. That could be you know, our principles. Um, maybe add something like that. I don't, I don't, I don't oppose that. I mean, that, that that's consistent with what I was taking. Uh, Commissioner Heminger, you've had. Yeah, <laughs> I just think as we're also thinking about the um, facade, could we just get like a brief history? And pardon my not understanding if it was already discussed, but could we get a brief history of the school and the park to understand what the significance is to the community and you know whether or not we should keep it, whether it's not something we want to see in a hundred years? Does anyone know the history of the school and park? But that's something that we could certainly get for you. This is what um, I mean. This what I have in terms of this school is built in 1923. Um, that's an image of it from. Oh, um, that, that's odd. When yeah. did it end? That's APS usage. So 1979. Yeah, and so in 1981 there was the land swap agreement. Um, where land, this land was swapped. The county wanted to swap land um, near the Boston Metro Station, so there's a land swap at that time. But that's a great question and something that I can ask our um, historic preservation and parks and recreation staff, and we can post an update on our webpage about that history of both. Um, if we're moving on to talking about, I, I heard some conversation about the principles. May I make a comment about the refinements to the principles? I'm just a little bit concerned about the principle that speaks to the open space and that maybe Margaret, if you could pull that up. Um, and I am concerned only, <clears throat> excuse me, to the effect that if there's a conversation about a taller building and a shorter building and the shorter building being closer to the street, tree conservation becomes a trade off. And so I just wonder. If you if you have it as a principle that you're prioritizing tree conservation, then you're kind of cutting off the conversation about different massings that might achieve a better result. You will have to note that. Um, I'm not first. Yeah, I get Stacy and then to push your stubborn. Uh, Ms. Meyer, hold on. Um, and we also have somebody on the line whose hand is up. Can you? One thing I want to throw out there. Are there any, before we get to further comments, or any other comments on the guiding principle? Because we have other things we have to get to, and we're already running uh, 30 quarter after eight just. I do want to leave time for public comments. There's a lot of people interested. Um, so, other than what we've been discussing now, are there other concerns with the guiding planning principles, with the agreement goes, or are there others that we would need to supplement? We've already identified some things that we could supplement that, which I think we're good. Um, there's others that we can do that. Now, first, Mr. Steinberg, and then Ms. Meyer. I'm glad to associate with the Welsh. Um, well, biophilic elements and things of that nature. I think that's fair game for us to negate since the park is so quintessential to the redevelopment of the site. I think it's fair game for us to put some thoughts and parameters in place for what we would like to see the site reflect with park. Smart. And I'd like to follow up this work, but we're good friends here. <laughs> I'd like to follow up to that. I actually was thinking that it might be a, a good principle to add to uh, consider the relationship to the park. So, so yeah, I think we're, we've got the consensus. On oh, as another planning. In, in addition to the principle. OK. Take it one level up. Note that. Um, I just want to align myself with uh, Commissioner Berkey's comments on uh, the 60 foot. I think we're still too early in the process to determine. Um, I think if we take 60 foot off, then we lose a lot of creative things that we're talking about right now. So 
I just wanted to just align myself with Commissioner Berkey. It's too soon to say, take 60 foot off. Right. I'm going to align myself on the line of because <laughs> uh, I think again, this is early days. So let's not pull out anything that we can use. And like Commissioner Hammond just said, you know, there's there's a lot we can do, a lot more we can do when the building's taller than it is when it's wider. So I, I'd say keep that on the table while in this early step. Uh, I'm not necessarily suggesting this as a guiding principle, but I do want to note uh, sort of the environmental impacts that there are with the complete teardown. And I know in previous discussions we've said this. Um, so just for the applicant to take that, among all the other things, to take into consideration as well. We are, and I think, and then could you? Yeah, just to to make sure everyone at the table was reminded, right? About three quarters of a mile at most, half a mile away from this site is a good example of the wisdom of not taking sixty feet off the table uh, because the the. The blocking and stacking gives us the outside margin, you know, gives us the outside lines. Um, and, and as we know from Riverhouse, just because the outside lines are here doesn't mean that the SPRC project is going to be here, right? We, we see in Riverhouse that you know, the outside lines can be up here. And, and now what we're talking about is this big. So uh, I, I think that that is wise to remember. And we have a, a very nearby example of, of the practical wisdom of, of not foreclosing the, you know, not contracting the outside lines before we get to the conversation about how big is the building and what does it look like. Thank you. Bagley? Yeah. Um, can staff pull the uh, massing thing back up again? And I should have clarified that my comment went to the footprint. That whole principle, I think, yeah. needs some revision. So I um the, the last so I'm looking at is this like a shadow study in this a way? It's not a shadow study. So I'm curious as a down the road. Um because the park, which we've spent a lot of time putting it, is on the southern exposure. Right. The height is really from no standpoint is the height one way or another gonna impact that. So yeah, so I mean, yes, pushing it away from the park, yes, I get, which I think is good. But just as a reminder, anything that they build there is not going to impact the light there, which is what you want for the park. Just to uh, join the idea that um, the landscaping and the biophilic is really, really important. In the coming um, livability 202, broad things, plants, livability, uh, you know. Biophilic, all those things are in open space are really, really important to the community because as you grow up, as you add more and more density, you have people who have don't have their own backyard. They have to use other people's backyard. So the, the open space and the, the landscaping becomes even more critical as you add density. Right. Yes, good point. Um, okay, I'd like now to move on to the next topic is density. Massive. And I think we've been touching upon that for the last half hour anyway. Um, so do we have any further? I know we what we are in is that we're definitely not ready to settle on any one specific height now. That that will depend. We need to do more looking at that. The like to have some flexibility. Um, we're a bit nervous about height. Um, any concerns there? But it's a question of trade off. Um, both the applicant and community. And I think we're not, we have, that's something that needs to be further explored. So anyway, that, that's my, my summing up of what I've heard around the table regarding um, the, the massive and lights last half hour. Any further discussion on this? I think we've um, Next topic. So we want to talk about setbacks on 23rd Street or a little bit more about transitions and sort of what those priorities are in terms of setbacks, green space, trees, historic preservation, lot coverage, potential units, building height massing. These are all topics you really have been yes. very much yes. discussing. 
So again, I think what my summary really <laughs> includes all of these topics. Yeah, I think that's right. And so maybe um, uh, if there, we, or, I have a, I have a, a green space. Then Commissioner Pesce. Sorry. Sorry? Uh, first, you and then Commissioner oh. Pesce. I have a, a question that might be green space and trees, and, and, and but it might also be correcting my ignorance. Um, is is it the applicant's intent, or is it under consideration, or not known, or not the applicant's intent, or something else uh, to as part of site as part of site mitigation to do any work on the park? And and I'm asking this very specifically because. Uh, Nia's point that the park is to the south, and in this, and and in the context of this discussion about um, working with the park, you know what I wonder is to the extent that trees are being removed on the north side of the building, right? Uh, could something like landscaping or tree planting or something in the park to make the park a better place? And and here I I I'm asking this with no knowledge of what the county is planning. Uh, uh, is that something that's I can let me answer? Yeah. The county just redid yeah, the yes, park. Okay. I just, before the applicant makes any response, I'd just like to say in 2019, yeah. there was an extensive redo of the park. Okay. So the park really is good. the park. <laughs> okay. So there's not, there's not really a practical opportunity for adding shade to the park as far as, as far as this is. Okay. Here, I'm going to show my ignorance, Margaret. Is parcel B part of the park? design yes so it was part of the design and what was okay okay so maybe forget i asked anything <laughs> <laughs> i would like to respond I, I was part of that park project uh design and it was you know the county did a pretty good job um i what wasn't part of that was melwood right we weren't thinking at the time about melwood so there's just a little fe dinky fence but separating that park from melwood and it's beautiful to the south of it but there's no separation from Melwood, it's like not there. there. So uh, there's a walk, you can take a look at the plan, you can see there's a walkway that kind of goes right against the fence. And so when the Melwood building comes up, it's going to be coming right up to that little pretty walkway they just put in. And then when the, when the building comes up, there's a little par a playground they just put in. So that looming kind of high building that's right against the park, with its windows or whatever it's going to have is going to really be an issue. So to your point of biophilic on the south side of Melwood, not on the park side, but on the Melwood yeah, side yeah. would, because there's no room, as you'll see on the park, there's no room to really do it there, but there potentially is, as we're, we're talking about massing, we've got all the options on the table. I'm going to say there's room to do it on the south side of Melwood, north side of the park. So it sounds like there's, there's a lot of room to work on this, these transition issues, but mm -hmm. uh, but definitely correct my ignorance was the option that Margaret took when it came to my question about anything like along 24th Street or you know, the south side of the park. Thank you. Yeah, Commissioner Sanders. Yeah, I just had a quick question. Um, I know we talked to good bit other. Oh, sorry. I know we talked a good bit about um, the building setbacks on 23rd Street South, but I'm wondering if there's going to be a conversation about the same thing on South Grant Street, um, just because the access, the preferred access for the site will be on Grant Street. And just looking at like a quick Google um, street view of South Grant, it's a really narrow street. And mm -hmm. it's, if we're if we're talking about access to the building from that street, you're going to see a lot of increased car traffic coming in and out of that building, which is it's fine. It's just I, I wonder if we could just have a conversation about what the street side will look like, just because that's you're going to see not just and you're not just going to see an increased car traffic. You're going to you're going to see an increase to and, it, and probably more increase of pedestrian traffic, more so than car traffic. And I don't know if there's a conversation this or SPRC, but I just want to put that out there. And then the other thing is just a, a little bit of just like a language clarification in the bouncing scenarios where we talk about um, in that space of the enhancing connectivity and, and mode for modes of child development. Yeah, just some more explicit language on what grants would look like. And then 
maybe some explicit language on improvements to bus stations along 23rd. Um, I know that it's, I guess, implied and it says redevelopment will necessitate sidewalk, bike, bike lane, other connectivity. I assume it's implied, but I, I, I would like to see explicit language on how we're bus stations just because I think some of them are covered, but I think that some of the bus stations on Long 23rd are not covered. With this kind of site, we're, we're going to see a lot more people. And if people are going to be using transit more than they are cars, then I think a conversation about how we're improving transit explicitly stated in the mass scenarios should. That was two things, but I hope that made sense. Yeah, yeah those are questions. Um, we could probably find that, for example, uh, Sidewalks under the street standards of the MTP, are these sidewalks up to spec? Would they have to be widened with the zoning mm -hmm. changes? What is there now? I know that. Uh, I'm not sure. We have transportation staff um, here at the meeting virtually. Um, but in terms of what the sidewalk width would have to be, I think we'd have to take a look at that and make sure that it conforms to all of the um, requirements for a side street like that. But I think that's an excellent point that right we have two frontages here. So we have 23rd and we have grant. So I yes, I would be curious to know what kind of a, a setback, building setback and some kind of an edge condition uh, would be most appropriate. Is it yeah, because it, it looked like I think on the which slide, but um just the like the way they described the sidewalk on 23rd was good condition, and then the way they described it on Grant was fair condition. And the fact that we're saying that our access to the building on Grant is the fact that that sidewalk is in fair condition, and we're saying that we want that access to be from there is a little concerning for the pedestrians that are going to be walking around that building. On a like, I just having a fair sidewalk on like fair condition doesn't it's good, but it's not good enough. <laughs> Or especially, and and I and I want to make sure that this conversation is a little bit geared more towards the pedestrian rather than the car. I understand there'll be parking. I understand there'll be more traffic, like car traffic, but I think there'll be more pedestrian traffic. And making sure that we're talking about not just Twenty Third, but Grant Street as well, in that context of how we'll be improving the facade for pedestrians. Um, I think it's implied, but I don't think it should be implied. If that makes sense. I think it should be very explicit. Um, okay, good. There's a covered bus stop right from there. There's a I, yeah, and I saw that, but I think some of the other bus stops aren't covered. And correct me if I'm wrong, because I haven't been there in a little bit. But they all should be. This is something that'll come up again in SBRC and yeah. then in, as a body, but now really zero in on shelter bus bus stops. I think awesome. Jim, you had mentioned that some time ago, and yeah. I stuck. <laughs> yeah. um, just to his point, uh, the Parks and Rec a guy who was at the Tier One definitely discussed hit the same concerns about Grant Street. I remember that about how people, you know, we've got the child care centers; they're coming down Grant Street. Uh, I don't your name, his name, but to address your point, this was brought up in tier one with the parks and rec people, and they were really worried about the children coming into the park, going down that street. What if there's loading going right through there? And a lot of people really use that park and use that walkway to get to the park. So it's a, definitely a valid concern that one that we well, that the community has been very worried about. Yeah. Don't forget on Sundays, Grand Street is one way heading south due to church uh, parking. Okay. Um, do we have any further right. comments on now 8.30? Um, if we don't have any further comments around the table for these topics, what I'd like to do is move on to public comments. A number of people who are interested. Um, we have around 19 people who would like to speak because there's so many. I'm going to have to limit it to one minute per person. Um, but you can actually say a lot in a minute. Um, and I think we'll have a lot of people that will be echoing what other people say. So it's perfectly okay to say what that person said, I agree with, and then move on. Not to cut you off, because if you want to continue with the that, please do. But just remember, that's an option. Um, so why don't we start 
getting ready for the virtual um, virtual uh, public participants would be first. And we're going to try to get those up. So if you're online as a public participant and you listed your name in the chat, get ready. We will look to call you. You will have 60 seconds for your comments. We will be timing. Um, our first person is uh, Suzanne Sunberg. Are you ready, Ms. Sunberg? You're on mute. You have to go off mute yourself. Um, I'm hearing something. Yeah, you're hearing funny. something, but it is very, very faint. Can you do something? Get your sound up. Ms. Sunberg needed to provide her comment through the chat. She said her device. Yeah, there she's she's providing a message to the chat right now. We have to actually do the comments in. Well, we'll come back because you can't do comments in the chat because they're not. I think mm -hmm. she's providing her comments to the online form then. Online, great. That's fine. Then we move on to the person. Um, Adam Thea, Mr. Thea, do you want to give comments? 60 seconds. Yes, hello. Uh, being close to Crystal City Metro and with access to a bus stop right next to the site, it's a great location for many stories of affordable housing. As noted, the building isn't historic with only two of the walls being original, it's gone through many significant renovations. And as per the shadow study, the new building would not cast any shadows on the homes in the park that nearby church doesn't already cast. Um, in fact, we shouldn't even limit the project to even just the five stories as proposed, allow for future flexibility and creativity to provide affordable housing or other community benefits. So I urge you to approve or to uh, recommend this onto the county board for approval. Uh, it's a great project needed for Arlington, critical to our fellow neighbors with disabilities and a great addition to the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fred Zimmerman, Mr. Zimmerman, Zimmerman, you are next. You have to go off and mute yourself. Uh, hi. Actually, it's I don't think it's that close to the Crystal City Metro. It's um, oh, almost a mile away. Um, and which is and it's kind of two major streets you have to cross too, which I'm not disabled and I find it hard to cross those streets. Um, also, I was wondering if the transportation study took into account the recent expansion of the Varietas Academy, which has all already uh, increased traffic on 23rd Street South. And um, I also agree with all the comments on Grant Street. That is a pretty narrow street, and if you're going to make that a major entrance, that needs to be really looked at. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Zerun. Uh, Alice Hogan is next. Ms. Hogan, go off mute. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. I'm speaking on behalf of the Alliance for Housing Solutions. Um, at this higher level of um, discussion, we would just point out that this lot needs planning guidance. The two parcels should be aligned in terms of zoning, and they're not. This is within a commercial cluster on a you know larger street. It's very close to Metro, close to the restaurant row. It's in walking distance to one of the you know largest multinational corporations on our planet. It's perfectly appropriate for uh, several floors of building to be in this location. We appreciate you all looking at it. We believe that affordable housing on the site is a very appropriate um, use we appreciate that a nonprofit would be providing that affordable housing and especially for its own special subpopulation and we look forward to um further discussion as it moves to the sprc thank you uh thank you Ms. hogan uh next up is malika scriven you can go off mute hello my name is malika scriven can everyone hear me yes we can Great, thank you. My name is Malika Scriven, Vice President of Planning and Development at the National Landing Bid. On behalf of the Bid's thriving business community in Crystal City, Pentagon City, and Potomac Yard, I wanted to make sure that we express our support to simply pursue the GLUP amendment process and amend the site's land use designation from public to low medium residential with the sole intent of adding affordable housing for people with disabilities. Um, we can't single-handedly change the outcomes in our community, but we surely hope that we can influence and inspire other stakeholders to simply value and prioritize 
inclusivity here on this site. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Um, and Devonza, Mr. Devonza, you're next. I'll walk you. Hi, uh, I'm a neighborhood resident and I want to speak to values and a nearby adjacent, uh, a nearby property that's a good example. For values, our neighborhood is in dire need of affordable housing. Rents are going up 20% or more. Every additional piece of affordable housing we get is a massive uh, benefit to our residents and should be heavily weighted uh, in that uh, context. I'd like to also point the commissioners to uh, Parkview, which is a six story apartment building in the Aurora Highlands neighborhood. It is directly adjacent to a park, in this case, Virginia Highlands Park. It is directly uh, across the street from many single family homes. And although we have many duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes and more in our neighborhood, and it, it, has, it is right on a very much more residential street than 23rd Street. And I've never really heard anyone complain about Parkview, despite the fact that it has more units. So please look at that as a very good precedent for this. I encourage you to support it. Thank you. Uh, ben Watts. Mr. Watts, you're up next. Go oh, off mute. Uh, yeah, thank you. Ben Watts, uh, Aurora Highlands. Um, yeah, I, I just, I, Feel that this building is, just does not go with the neighborhood, and um, and the the people they seem to be um, obsessed with a certain amount of density. And they're they're either going to build it higher or wider to 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 have this density, and uh, it just doesn't it doesn't fit with the neighborhood. Uh, it's a single family neighborhood, and um, it that's one of the re I've lived in the neighborhood a long time, and and that's one of the thing the things. That, I've always loved about this neighborhood. It's, it's a little bit of a preserved neighborhood right in the middle of all the city. And uh, and it, I really would hate to see the historical value uh, of the neighborhood changed at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, George Sarkis is next. Go no, off mute. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll make it. Uh, I'll make it quick. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm uh, opposed to this. I believe the building is too tall. It's too dense. And um, this is really doesn't benefit our neighborhood. I think it's just for the money, actually, for Melwood. But if you look on 23rd Street, where this big building is being planned, it would stick out from whatever end you're looking down on 23rd Street, you would see it. And um, as far as the density, it, 100 units, if you count up 100 houses, it would take about five blocks to equal that amount of density that they wanna squeeze into about two thirds of a block. And so that adds a lot of cars, adds a lot of traffic, and uh, I'm opposed to it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Shane Green is next. Ms. Green? Yes, hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Jane Green. I Can used to live in this, Can you hear me? Uh, a little bit louder, please. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, I'll try my best. Um, I used to live in this neighborhood. My son used to go to daycare across the street. I've spent a lot of time in Nellie Custis Park. Um, I think this building will be a great asset to the neighborhood. I think we should not be concerned about a building so close to a park. If you've ever been to the new Roslyn Highlands Park up in Roslyn, um, it's directly kind of in the uh, sort of uh, elbow or the, the L point of a much taller building and it's a very well loved park. So parks and tall buildings can happily coexist. Um, the affordable housing that will be built could be built at this site will be a great asset to the neighborhood. Um, and also I love the one minute public comment. So um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Have a good Thanks. evening. Thank you very much. Um, Bob DiLeonardo is next. Yes, thank you for the opportunity to share my opinion. I'm significantly disabled as of the last three years. And uh, so I, I'm very, very interested in Melwood's success and I believe in what they do, but I don't support this plan. I don't support this plan as it is proposed. It proposes something that I don't think is helpful to the neighborhood. I don't think it fits in the neighborhood. <clears throat> Perhaps more importantly, I don't think it proposes something that is helpful to the community it is meant to, dis to serve. It's uh, to concentrate, I, we've learned a lot in the 60s, 70s, and 80s about concentrating low affordable housing in one area or in one building. 
the stigmatization and isolation that it offers its clients is not something I think that is helpful or beneficial to them. I don't know if we're overlooking this, but it would be something I think that should be considered. Perhaps some something could be built, but not necessarily the uh, proposed density. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, a reminder, if you wanted to speak, public speaker virtually, you need to go to the chat and put your name there. Um, we have one more. Um, Jason, Jason Schwartz. Um, hi, my name is Jason Schwartz, and I would just like to say I um, support this um, project here. I think it would be great as affordable housing. And uh, one of the things that we often see in Arlington is that new projects get built along arterial, arterial roads and very busy uh, uh, streets. And I think this is a great opportunity to provide people on um, that opportunity to live in this community um, very close to all the amenities, very walkable, bikeable, many bike share stations. Uh, but also be in a place where they're not having to live directly on um, a major arterial. So I think um, the housing belongs um, at this site. It's going to be a really, it's going to be a blessing for the, the neighborhood and more people will be walking and it'll make it safer and uh, just a great, a great project. Thank you, so uh, thank you, Mr. Schwartz. Uh, John Obenberger is on the line. I go off mute. You have a minute. All right, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, object to the project uh, due to its density, uh, specifically its height uh, and number of dwelling units. Uh, no mention of the number of parking spaces. You have 100 units. Uh, you're going to need uh, a minimum of close to 100 uh, parking spots on site to be able to accommodate the parking. The adjoining neighborhood and streets do not have surface street parking to accommodate it. I've uh, spent 15 years driving through and around the neighborhood, uh, taking our kids to different schools, different sporting events, cultural events in that area, problematic to drive um, on the narrow streets in the neighborhood. Context, 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 uh, three stories maximum, 35 feet. Uh, understand uh, the desire for more housing, but it doesn't fit, doesn't fit the zoning, doesn't fit the adjoining properties or the block or the neighborhood, uh, totally out of context. And if the developer can't make it work, so be uh, it. Uh, uh, we now move to the in-person. <laughs> uh, yes, actually here representing uh, Arlington Bridge Association. Well, you could talk to the table. <laughs> Excuse me? You could have talked at the table. Too. Yeah, well, well, thank you. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, we have varied opinions on this in terms of like, the association. Some support, some don't, but we're all in in terms of participating in this process as it plays out. Uh, but I'm going to take my ARCA hat off for a moment. And as a parent of two adults with disabilities, I do not want this effort to lose sight of the need. Bellwood is here to, because there's a need. And so as this process plays out, do please bear that in mind because there is not enough support in Arlington County for people with disabilities in terms of wraparound services, life skills, et cetera. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Williams is next. Jeff Williams here. Um, I'll speak to this site a little bit. It's uh, located uh, the proposed site, uh, it's surrounded by churches. It's on three sides. Um, the Nelly Custis Park provides some separation from the single farm on 4th Street. I support massing scenario number three that shifts the building heights to the front of the site, which provides more tapering options to the single farm. Um, I've attended multiple civic association meetings. Uh, and I'm aware that the nearby neighbors strongly oppose uh, this development. Um, that they feel that this building is out of context. Uh, and I would just like to provide a, a, a different view. Um, I do not think a five story building at this location is incompatible with the nearby single family residences. And as a point of reference, for many years, my family resided at the Shawnee Apartments at 700 South Courthouse Road in the Penrose neighborhood. It's a five story multifamily building that's adjacent to a park and single family homes. And if it had not been available in 1962, that place came in. Your time is up. 
Um, Natalie Atkins. Natasha. No, I'm sorry, Natasha. Right. I, I have all thought. the time. <laughs> I hope everybody here has been site. It is not an urban site. It is a residential neighborhood. There are some commercial buildings around it. It is surrounded by churches with large amounts of space. Um, we live behind one of the 35 foot buildings across the street. And it, we look out on the Berlin Wall every day from our backyard. So how you do this building is really important to the neighborhood. Um, I hope Melwood can find a way to make a plan that does what it wants within the scale of this neighborhood. But 45 or 60 feet is really out of scale on one block in the middle of this neighborhood. This is not Langston Boulevard. Thank you. Um, uh, Nick Jacoby? Yes, Nick Jacoby here. Uh, I don't want to talk about the merits of the application, but rather the legality of the proposal and the lack of faithfulness to decades of Arlington County planning principles. If successful, this project will likely be the start of a parcel by parcel rezoning of 23rd Street rather than an orderly and planned process. Within this proposal, with this proposal as a precedent, other property owners will present heartfelt pleas for illegal spot zoning in direct opposition to the decades of collaborative planning that this main street in the center of our district has had. I'd also like to set the record straight on livability 22202, the coalition of Arlington Ridge, Aurora Highlands, and Crystal City Civic Associations. Livability does not have a position on the Melwood proposal. Any assertion or implication that livability has taken a position are misrepresentations of the simple fact. In closing, I urge you to pay close attention to the November 21st letter from the Aurora Highland Civic Association. I think that laid out the points that we think should be addressed first, rather than getting to Matt uh, Bassett. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Time's up. Um, Rob Douglas. Thank you. I'd like to uh, I'd like to uh, uh, thank Mr. Jacoby for what he just said. Could I, by any chance, put that height um, slide back up? Is that possible? Which one? The, the height one. I could see the proposed Melwood the, with the yellow building. Yes, yeah, right. So, so I noticed in the presentation that you said that the height is similar to the buildings around. Uh, the highest building on the, the chart that you had was the Calvary. I think that's the bell tower at the Calvary Methodist Church. Um, nothing else comes close to it. This is all zoned for 35 foot buildings for a reason. We've put up with a lot of us residents from 22202. There are five, six, seven, eight cranes. There's been so much density on Fern Street, on South East. You name the building, you, know, you name the street in, in our area, and you've got massive buildings, you know, 20, 30, you know, I don't know how big these buildings are, but you know, we're talking crazy, crazy buildings. We don't need this here. I appreciate what Melwin no does, but they could find a site that's more appropriate. They could sell this bit this uh building back to the county the county could put an elementary school we could do something with it but but it, it for them to, to come to us and 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 i appreciate uh miss miss peterson's um comments is, is that your name ma'am you asked about the sale of this thing if it, if it ever made it through the permit process could they sell it and i noticed that the wellesley housing association that the development partner they had built or they had uh, they had uh, been in charge of uh, developing 35 sites, but they only own 30. So five of them are sold. Uh, that's what we're worried about here. And we just don't think it's appropriate. Uh, Rachel. Yes. Hicks. Hi. Um, so I think some major concerns here are the fact that this is being done so they can qualify for tax credits. It's for money. It is not about the Melwood cause. We love our neighbors. We love the residents, or not residents, the clientele of Melwood. We frequently come out for Miracle on 23rd Street. We support them, but we want them to have the same quality of life that we enjoy in the neighborhood, which is low density. We are surrounded on all sides. Our streets are too small. When a tree fell on 23rd recently, the buses couldn't get through 24th. It was a nightmare. There's not room at this site. I think something much smaller would be more appropriate. And I think if it was much smaller, there would not be as much opposition. Everyone was up in arms because this survey didn't let you say whether you wanted this building or not. There are preschools that use that okay. um, playground. The mass is too big. The grocery store is like a mile away. 
um, we're really concerned. There's not enough room right here. And we also love the historic building. We need our community spaces. We are a low residential area. We want it to re remain low. We would love for them to be able to participate in our community as it is and come join us. And we would love to welcome them. But as it stands right now, it's going to be a blight. It's going to be huge. It's not going to work. It's going to cause traffic and congestion up. issues as well as groundwater. Thank you. Our next commenter is Matthew Wallach. Hi, how's it going, everybody? Um, I live in 2202. I'm in Riverhouse. Um, I'm just going to make this much quicker. Um, I echo Ben and Adam, um, Adam Theo and Ben particularly. I brought the same statistic on the RETs. Um, so I've been hearing a lot of the public comments that I'm going to try to address rather than paper I brought, um, such as uh, I think this is the opposite of isolation. It's being done by a nonprofit, not by a politically polarizing national project like some places in previous decades have been done. Um, we need to think about equity and plans going forward because of, you know, housing being more expensive in cities and because of the lessons of the past. Um, if this, the historic facade is probably the last thing to worry about when equity is being concerned and the place-based development. Um, if the context changes, it seems like it's changing the context for a better one. Um, and uh, that pretty much sums up the summarized version of what I'm Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Josue Amaya. Hello, everyone. My name is Josue, and I work for the nonprofit Our Stomping Ground. Our Stomping Ground's mission is to help adults with disabilities live independently. And again, it's that opportunity to have that, and this will help provide that opportunity. I imagine many of us can remember the time we lived on our own and had that chance to do that, and everyone should have that opportunity. This is why this is so important. Right now, we support about 16 adults in the Nova area, and this is just going to add more. And our goal is to keep expanding and assist Wesley and assist our other partners to have this because it is so important. You know, like I said, I mean, I remember the first time I was like, adults with disabilities should have that too. We all deserve a good, you know, happy life and the chance, just the chance. And this is what this is about. Thank you. Um, Juan Bong. Um, he's going to. Um, Play his uh, message. Could you? You need to reset the timer. I have a place to call my own. I am part of the caring community, which I never thought I would be. Our stopping ground has helped build my community that. I have friends and neighbors to do activities with, like taking walks, going swimming together, book clubs, lunch by dinners, etc. My life is full, which I never thought I would have. I hope that more buildings like Gilead Place can be built so more people with disabilities can live in and get better quality of life. Thank you. Um, our next commenter is Margo Greenlee. Hi, everyone. I believe I'm last on the list yep. tonight, right? We have one more. Oh, okay. Excellent. Um, really good to have Josue and Juan with me tonight. I'm the executive director of Our Stop Ground. We partner with Leslie at, uh, Wesley at three other locations across Northern Virginia to help people with developmental disabilities find and match up with affordable housing and then thrive once they're there with fantastic community engagement, like going on walks, like going to the library. Uh, so hopefully with the passage of this proposal, and I know that there's many stages to go, you will be your best neighbors. You're going to see us walking down the street picking up trash. We're going to invite you over for our yoga class <laughs> because the doors are going to be open. That's the whole point of inclusive housing. When OSG residents are there, we are also friends of the whole building and we invite everybody to participate. So in terms of context, I ask you to also think about equity and, and what the future of Arlington County Hi. Thank you. Um, and we have one final online commenter, uh, Tawanda Dixon. Hi, I'm with Melwood. I'm the director of um, the day program over in Melwood. And I just appreciate the recommendations of affordable housing. We have several people within the 
integrated day program who are hoping and praying to live in the community where they come at least five days a week to learn skills to be more independent. Um, the people who come to Melwood, they volunteer at your local flower shops and at the local gyms. They support local businesses within the community and they love it. I approve of the project and promoting any project that's going to be promoting people with disabilities to live in the place that they help support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there was a final public comment. Um, if anybody feels they forgot to say something or would like to add more, we continue to have opportunity to give comments online at the LRPC website for this particular project. They will become part of the public record for this. We all do read them. Um, so please take advantage of that. And that's just open. So at any time you want to do it, just go in and do it. So um, you certainly take advantage. Um, this will be concluding tonight's meeting. We will have been scheduling an additional meeting going forward. Um, we'll digest what we have here and then move on to the next one. Um, I do want to thank everybody coming out in this, this really cold, gloomy night. Um, your comments have been great. I think this has been very constructive. We definitely heard both those in favor and those opposed. Your comments have been very thoughtful on both sides. That really has helped tremendously in helping um, helping decide how we want to move forward. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Right. Right. Oh, oh, thank you. 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 Thank you.